Thank you, everyone. And um, please, please apologize. I'll be sitting down as I'm currently 3D printing another human being in my belly. So easier for me, I won't faint during the presentation or get out of breath, which I do easily nowadays. Anyway, um, my name is Katarina Kari. Um, I've worked at Zalando for two and a half years now, and it's actually, I want to thank Connected Data for asking me to give this talk, because this is really the first time I'm telling and thinking about the story of the past two years, of actually starting this whole project of knowledge graphs that wasn't there before at Zalando, and how, how that all was. So this talk is going to, I'm just going to give you a small overview of Zalando, um, then I'm going to move on to define the knowledge graph as we understand it at Zalando. Um, tell you a little bit about the beginning and how it all started. Um, then what we've actually implemented and where we're seeing currently the added value. And just have a few <coughs> pointers on enterprise knowledge graphs as well, which uh, we've experienced. And I hope you um, maybe it'll be useful for, for you as well, if in, in, especially if you're considering and having a knowledge graph in your company. So Zalando, at a glance, you'll, you see fantastic numbers from 2017 here. Um, we are uh, Europe's market leader in fashion e-commerce. So we sell fashion online. Um, we're in 17 countries, which is um, good to know, because that means that uh, we need to operate in at least 12 languages. Um, we have over 24 million active customers that's, um, who are making over 90 millions of orders. So um, there's quite a lot of traffic in terms of the kind of stock availability of our products. And of mentioning those products, we have over 300,000 products available in our catalog. So managing all that and making that accessible to our customers, making it findable to our customers, is a big uh, topic. Um, our vision is to connect people with fashion. I think this is um, really aligns really nicely with how I see knowledge graphs or ontologies and semantic web in general. I think it's one part of human computer interaction that is not uh, visual, <laughs> but is actually based on data. So I see ontologies very much being kind of the human human voice, if you want to say, in, in, in data, and uh, good at being between people and um, data. And here it's data on fashion. So um, what do we mean when we say knowledge graphs? Um, I think there are always different ways of um, understanding them and applying them. Uh, for us, knowledge graph is mainly a name-directed graph of concepts that have URL-like identifiers. And at Zalando, we are building that using RDF, so the resource description framework. Um, the identifiers we have, um, we are implementing the IRI standard, um, but since we're <laughs> using Latin characters, could also be the URI standard. Um, and internally, those identifiers do work as web pages as well. Yeah, web pages as well, with which you can look up all the information around that one concept. Um, like I said, this, the edges are named and directed, and we distinguish between two types of edges. Structural edges, such as subsumption, instantiation, part whole relationships, and associative relationships. So um, structural just means that you can like do a lot of um, logical reasoning on top of things. So if somebody wants to um, see pumps, like high-heeled shoes, um, that means that they're in, in more in broader in this context of looking at shoes in general. Um, that's structural information. Associative means that we can cross-link between uh, concepts that seem to be very different, such as beach and bikinis. So beach is a very structurally very different concept than a bikini, but for humans, they have a very strong association. 
And so what do we use this knowledge graph for? We're driving mainly two types of customer use cases. Um, we, are in, um, we want to understand the language of our customers and want to also speak the language of our customers or at least speak in a correct way to them in a functional way. And so this means in search, for example, if a customer is typing certain kind of words, they might be using words like a light colored top that fits a garden party. Well, none of those things mentioned in that search query are actually in our product data. So if you would then try to kind of, I don't know, elastic search your way around to product data, um, wouldn't necessarily work. Um, that's why we have the knowledge graph in between to interpret what light colored means um, in very um, kind of explicit manner that product data is understood and that the where, like the databases can operate with and um, and say what tops are well these are shirts these are can be tank tops and so on um, so that we can retrieve the right kind of contents to our customers um, hopefully independent mostly independent of the language they use obviously it's not like we're not complete and perfect yet but we're getting there um, the other use case is for browsing. So uh, depending on our customer's context where they find themselves in, um, we can make sure that they have the best possible view of, of that um, available to them. So this um, means also that we work together with teams in Zalando that work on personalization. So we maybe um, are using our knowledge graph to, or maybe they are actually using the knowledge graph to understand what customers prefer. And when they are in this certain context, that view might look different to, to them than their um, other, other people, other customers. Um, but also what we then suggest afterwards or how we uh, enable them to move in our shop could be driven dynamically with, with this knowledge graph. And that's currently something we are working on. Um, in this knowledge graph, fashion concepts are at the core. So um, these fashion concepts, uh, we've designed and modeled them in such a way that we could in the future, if we want, and if we have the proper business use cases for it, um, the proper endorsement from management, um, to make a schema.org extension. I mean, schema.org is really good for e-commerce, um, but like, like said in previous talks, um, it just has things in it and that's not helpful for fashion because all we do is we sell things but we want to be specific of what we're we're selling so um, a whole fashion vocabulary could be made available to to the public um, driven by us I, at least I think that's how that at least we've prepared uh, to do it if if that is reasonable the future will tell um, another thing is we could also take this fashion ontology and just have it as part of the linked open data for anyone to see and use and, and so on. So at least it's, we are prepared for it. Um, the knowledge graph also uh, maintains uh, connections uh, to the contents we have at Zalando. So these are, among others, our products, but then also editorial things like blog posts about those light colored tops that people are wearing at garden parties or any kind of lifestyle, lifestyle ideas and collections and so on. Um, we are also maintaining an application ontology to drive our um, applications uh, so that um, they know how to use or what to use from those fashion concepts. Um, it's, it's all very practical and um, like built on as needed basis. Um, but it's kind of fun, fun to, to define that as well. Um, and then we link to external vocabulary. So currently what I'm doing is, or what my team is, or the modelers are doing is, um, we are connecting this, our fashion concepts to existing concepts via all same as properties <laughs> to concepts in Wikidata, for example. And that's so that we are at least prepared to at some point look at harnessing the tr some of the translation ideas from Wikidata. Mm -hmm. Because we need to maintain 12 languages and maybe our translators don't have that much time. So we could also kind of get it from external vocabularies. Um, why not? That's just one idea and one use case um, which we could support. Um, 
inside the company, communicating the knowledge graph, I mean, now we've defined it in, in a very practical way, that how we see it or how, how the team sees it and teams are seeing it, um, but communicating the knowledge graph to different professionals um, um, it, it is kind of tricky. <laughs> So um, product managers don't really care at all if it's a knowledge graph or an ontology or if it runs on whatever graph database. All they really want to know is, does this improve the experience of our customers? Can we like retain more customers? Can we get them back? Can we create awesome experiences? And does this make money? Those, that's all they, they are interested in. Um, and that's how we build our arguments. Um, Backend engineers have a hard time understanding the open world assumption. Um, so things in the graph might change. And uh, there's actually no way to kind of restrict the data in, in knowledge graphs. So um, the, we've, I've already had some like um, hallway talks about this with, with uh, colleagues. And it's really interesting. It, it seems to be a, a kind of persistent problem. Um, we are mainly... What we're doing here is um, there's certain modeling principles we uphold. Um, also, we uh, have maintained some modeling promises that this will never change or this is immutable and this is, you can rely on or there's going to be some something else happening, but you will be notified. Um, and then application ontology helps here slightly as well. Um, also, many times... Backend engineers have some favorite data database, and it might not be a graph database. And they'd be like, "Well, why graph databases? This application, this use case, we could solve with something else as well." But all of the applications and all of the reusability and all of the future applications, we couldn't necessarily do if we wouldn't start with a graph database here. Um, machine learning experts that uh, there are much more of in Zalando. Um, for them, like they. <laughs> There's not much knowledge there, or more knowledge needs to happen with them. They um, see graph databases as just uh, another data source, and they usually complain that I have only hundreds of concepts in there. So they're like, well, I can't use that, I need millions. Mm. Whereas they could, they, they would pick up a book. No, sorry, I need to do that work. Um, so in the beginning, when we started this, we had two hypotheses. One was uh, search can be improved with uh, machine learning algorithms, and that was what we were working on already. But most successful search engines seems to be using this thing called knowledge graphs. Um, we should explore that possibility. So this was also coming from upper management saying, is this something of strategic value? The other one is that, is a stat especially for fashion, is a static category tree with which you can find products or with which customers online can find products, is that the best way to represent fashion contents? Because yes, you have some like physical stuff uh, happening in your clothes and things like materials and colors and shapes. But then on the other hand, there's a lot of like different ways to access that because maybe um, some items are used to create a particular illusion or for a certain purpose, like a style, to conform with a formal style or, or a, um, a bohemian style. Um, so in the beginning, um, like I said, there was little semantic web knowledge in the company. Um, and the, the kind of first comments I got was, well, machine learning works better. Actually, it was my was a colleague that now is our lead and the biggest driver of Semantic Web, but he said that in the beginning. And so I found myself defending the Semantic Web so much in the beginning. Um, another one was that um, uh, a lot of question was around um, that it's manual work. Um, uh, will it scale if you're doing all of this manually? And um, that's when I've kind of applied this idea of can't remember who said it, but the little semantic goes a long way. Is the like one of these sentences, and which I really love, and it's true. I mean, we're already improving search with only like tw twenty well-defined fashion concepts. Um, just to kind of reveal some trade secrets, is surprising how much a change you can do with just a little bit of semantics. Um, and then there was this like idea that okay, well, I've seen ontologies being used in another company where I was working at, they didn't work. So that was that. Uh, but luckily we had upper management endorsement 
and um, and then we put up this um, team together that was mainly consistent of backend developers um, and some research, one product guy, or actually a lady. And um, so I found myself doing a lot of knowledge sharing on ontologies and the frameworks RDF and the query language Sparkle um, for that team. Um, picking like these things up, I mean, getting into this topic of the whole semantic web, I mean, this meant that all the members of my team, for them, this was a new topic. Um, and you can see here the kind of type of skills we had in the, in, in the, the team. Um, they all still, like, after having this learning curve, they do see the added value of semantic web and graph databases. So we've recognized it and the company is recognizing it and um, also skeptical leads and management are, are seeing it now. Um, there's still like someone, or there's still the argument that the current applications we could do with other databases as well. Um, and that's true to some extent, but then, um, but not, not everywhere. And so getting into this topic of semantic web, what was hard to learn was actually the modeling. The modeling and the defining of the concepts and how do you define them and what do you mean with structural and in, what, why can't I just make an instance out of this? Why does it have to be a subclass? Like all these small modeling decisions that an ontologist is doing. And I was also um, using a kind of applied applied idea of onto clean, which for the semantic web, uh, semantic web um, experts here says maybe something mo to most nothing. Um, onto clean is also like the research paper on it is really hard to read. Um, so we've applied it. Um, and these were like, these were the things that were hard to understand. And the question is still like, how can you make sure that um, if you do a certain kind of modeling and how do you base your modeling decisions that it will work in all applications and so on. All these kind of different questions that you can see here. But what was easy to learn, as, um, maybe because everyone's backend heavy or the team is very backend heavy, um, is uh, Sp was Sparkle or is still Sparkle and RDF and even TTL. This difference that serialization that's a serialization we are using, and even graph databases in itself how they work. So so no problems there really. It's more like the idea of the modeling in ontologies. Um, so what the team really likes in, in Semantic Web and getting into this topic, uh, they actually really like Sparkle. <laughs> um, it's kind of fun to see it. And, and the, the next one on the list uh, is the, the idea of interlink, interlinkedness already on data level, how seemingly very different things um, are now connecting via our fashion concepts that we've defined in the graph. And um, yeah, that's been really, Fun to see. So what we have, have we implemented so far? Obviously the knowledge graph on a graph database, um, and then tooling with which this, uh, the fashion concepts that we maintain can be linked to Zalando contents. We've also like mentioned, um, implemented a lookup um, site for, for all the fashion concepts. Um, tooling to manage translations, 17 countries, very important. Um, and a data dashboard with which we can see the performance of, of our concepts. Plus that nice visualization, which is very static now, um, but it actually moves and jumps and it's really cool. Everybody loves to see it. Uh, where do we see the most value in, in the graph? We are actually measuring a significant improvement. We are making money uh, with, uh, um, with search that is powered by the graph. And um, the fashion, fashion concepts we've defined don't only fetch products, but they fetch all these different kind of contents like editorials. So making, making up a view on a website for us now is um, much easier. Um, certain learnings, and I, I have more slides than I have time, so I hope I'll have time to go through all of these. Um, but the graph contents is peer reviewed. And uh, this means that we're actually maintaining the fashion concepts as well as the application ontology in a GitHub repository. 
um, upon which we do pull requests. Uh, and we uh, merge them to master uh, through a full I principle, so they need to be approved. Um, the modeling principles um, that I talked about earlier to make backend developers make things clear for backend developers is that we, yes, like I said, adapt it on the clean principle in terms of modeling. Um, we are checking consistency in terms of the contents that each fashion concept serves. Um, and the modeling is done as needed basis. So we are building the graph for each use case. It's a use case first. First we have a use case and then we have the modeling. But obviously with the hindsight that this still can be reused for other use cases. Um, we do not store the contents that we serve in the knowledge graph. This might be very surprising, but we cannot store it in the knowledge graph. Um, the stock and av availability information of the products we sell changes so fast all the time that a knowledge graph is not the efficient way to do it. Um, so it's impossible. What we do store is we store uh, the rules with which you can call APIs to retrieve the products for each fashion concept. And then other services use those rules to then write this information onto the products in their services if they need it. And then other services are using that again to drive search, for example. So we're, um, yeah, just an integral, uh, one data layer part of a microservice uh, infrastructure. Um, you probably want to know what graph database we're using. Well, we're using Amazon Neptune. We did start with a very interesting but slightly, <laughs> slightly failed um, idea of building our own triple store on the atomic. Um, but then moved very fast to using Blaze Graph, knowing that Amazon Neptune is going to come and it's based on Blaze Graph. Um, here's an interesting story. Um, how did we decrease latency in one of uh, in several of our um, applications? But one this is example from one application. We have actually really complex modeling. Sorry about that. Um, on what actually is a fashion concept, and uh, based on the modeling, uh, what is a fashion concept is implied, not explicitly said. And so the Sparkle queries for each application ontology can be really complex. Uh, which leads to latency. So it's a lot of unions and so on and joins and, and, and stuff like this. Um, so we actually maintain, we use rules and we maintain an inferred triples stored in named graphs that we rewrite on each time the graph changes. And this way we got this nice job in latency, which was wonderful. Do I have time for this one? This is the final story. To you. You're it's, reducing your question time. So I know. It's, it's yeah. Is. Well, I mean, I just. <laughs> that's great. It's true. But um, so, what does Beyonce and GDPR have to do with each other? Um, Beyonce was my go to example when we started Knowledge Graphs because it was one of the main top, top, no, um, top search search queries that our customer were doing. That was because she <laughs> launched a brand called Ivy Park. Nobody remembers a new brand, but they do remember Beyonce, so be like, Beyonce. And then Zalando wouldn't be able to give any products for that until certain um, things were fixed. Um, and I was back then arguing, well, if you would have a knowledge graph, this would be solved and we could understand that Beyonce means in fashion concept, uh, in fashion world means now surf Ivy Park clothes. Um, but currently, um, legal is very, legal department is very strict on GDPR. Um, so we're not really sure if we can store that kind of thing without making really strong GDPRs, um, GDPR um, safe keeps around our knowledge graph. So currently we're not storing any kind of people's first names <laughs> in the graph. Um, but yeah, it's just a kind of fun story. To sum it up, our knowledge graph at Zalando is satisfying use cases, use cases first, uh, it's peer reviewed and, and adapted to a microservice landscape. And the knowledge graph adds convenience for our customers and drives a dynamic shop experience. That's the story and that's my talk. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for the talk. Uh, first, I have to comment that you're very brave on using Onton Clean. Congrats. <laughs> it's a quite uh, challenging methodology to explain well. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that your users may ask things in the form of a question. For example, I would like a top that goes that is good for the beach or for some garden party, etc. This reminds me of question answering rather than just searching with keywords. Have you thought or are you, is it in your plans to start facilitating via the knowledge graph and of course other NLP techniques some kind of question answering instead of just um, instead of merely transforming words into concepts and then just doing any research? Mm, we, I mean, it depends really what customers want. They don't really necessarily want an answer to that. They want to see products. When they, so, so they very quickly want to get them to see clothes and products. Um, so here we will probably opt for no, we are not investing in answering questions. But definitely if that kind of use case comes up, like what should I in general wear for a garden party, then maybe this uh, knowledge graph could be used to drive exactly that kind of use case. Hi, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that you um, were able to measure the impact that the ontology changes and the introduction of knowledge graph had um, in the application. Um, how did you measure it and how did you decouple it from other changes, uh, application, uh, new features, bug fixing? Um, A-B testing. So if um, like you have the A variant where knowledge graphs are not used, and then you of oh, the, the fashion concepts, and then you have the B variant. So this is for search, for example, the B variant where in this we know that in this interpretation of a search query, the f knowledge of a fashion concept was used. Um, so then we would like in all the cases where we've used them, uh, this is how much people were in it ended up buying things or clicking on them and interacting with them, and then we um, calculated the difference. So it's an estimate, really, but A-B testing is what we're using mainly. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. I live in Switzerland and I buy a lot from Zalando. Yeah, Switzerland so it's good there. to know that actually <laughs> it's powered by uh, linked data. The question I, I have is, how did this all start? who at what part of the organization decided that now we're going to introduce a knowledge graph? Um, I, I happened to have lunch with a VP because um, my colleague said you should talk with him and he got really excited to know that I am actually somebody who knows about semantic web because he apparently had been looking for people who know about the semantic web. So when he found me or when we found each other that's where we started to kind of uh, build the team. Why was he looking for people with semantic knowledge? Because in his previous company, um, he saw the benefit of knowledge graphs and he wanted strategically to, for Zalan to explore that as well. Great talk, thanks. Um, you said that you put together a team of back-end engineers and some uh, research engineers. Did you repurpose in-house talent or did you recruit specifically for this? Um, at that time we were recruiting anyway in Helsinki, in the Helsinki Tech Hub quite a lot. Um, so in already in interview questions we would ask for kind of readiness and interest in this. Um, um, but we did source in-house talent as well, like people would switch from teams to others. And, and was it difficult uh, for some that weren't specifically previously involved in linked data to kind of make the transition or were they on board? Well, I think the use case in itself was so interesting that they, they wouldn't be like at least too like, what was it, semophobia, semophobic yeah. about it. Um, but certainly driving them into the topic of semantic web was quite a lot of work. Um, I can see you have a sort of virtuous circle thing going on here where you're building on successes that you've kind of already had and people are uh, getting interested in buying into what you're doing. I guess my question is, how much work did you have to do right up front before you got the first benefit? What was your sort of minimum deliverable product that you, that you had to do before anybody could see that it was worth doing? I mean, we only started measuring improvement and success in search this autumn. It's 
one and a half years. Right. And then before that, I was preparing the, to even start this project another half years, so two years. So not so quick then, really. No. <laughs> it's now all good and fun, but yeah. you know, it was a lot of blood and tears <laughs> before that. Okay, good to know. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Uh, one, one, one final question. I have a follow-up uh, on the skills uh, question that was asked earlier. So you mentioned that one of the challenges was uh, ontology modeling for the people to learn. Then that means that also engineers did ontology modeling? Um, it's not really good for a company to have only a few bottlenecks for modeling. So we do want everyone to be um, involved in this work. Obviously, uh, most modeling tasks do fall on my desk and my colleagues' desk. Um, but for them to at least understand it is very important. Um, and then they do model the application ontology already. So the, okay. the engineers, the backend engineers are working on the application ontology themselves. <laughs> might steal one more, then it means that they also had some data modeling experience already. No, no. Not so in no terms data of modeling. ontologies. Okay. No. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Okay. okay. Big thanks to Katerina. Thank you so much.